Through recording, preserving, and educating, the mission of the Steamship Historical Society of America is to share the impact of engine-powered vessels, their crews, and their passengers with future generations. My name is Amy Vichari, and I'm the Education Director. With me now is Doug Tilden, former VP of the United States Lines, South America, and later CEO of Marine Terminals. He spent the last five decades in the shipping industry, working his way up from being a dock clerk to serving as a top executive within a global Fortune 100 corporation. Containerization really made shipping more efficient in a variety of ways. Can you talk a little bit about how it affected costs at the port? When you're uh, discharging a brake bulk ship, you're handling maybe 10 to 12 tons an hour of general merchandise, for example, the white shirts coming from Busan going to Chicago. When you're unloading a container ship, you're doing 25 containers an hour, maybe 15 to 20 tons per container. So that's four to 500 tons an hour. Uh, In terms of cost, if today we were unloading a break bulk ship with uh, cartons on it, there aren't any more in the world, but if we were, my guess is it'd be $100 to $120 a ton to handle it and deliver it to a truck. But today, on a per ton basis, to discharge and deliver a full container load of white shirts is maybe $23 a ton. And this goes to the whole supply chain. At every step, you've eliminated handling of cartons, and you're picking up a container with 15 to 20 tons in it. It becomes much more efficient. But our average revenue per container in 1984 uh, from Asia to the United States was about $4,200 per 40-foot container. Today, that cost is less than $2,000. And I don't know many industries that over a 30- or 40-year period have seen their costs cut more in half in whole dollars, never mind inflation in adjusted dollars. The other thing that changed with container ships was crew size. The crew size on these uh, last of the break bulk ships for U.S. lines was over 40 people because you had a lot of maintenance. Uh, Little cranes on deck required constant maintenance and greasing. The engine room required quite a contingent of engineers. You needed people to cook meals. You had a purser and a radio operator. And with the container ships, they're so functional uh, and they're so automated that that crew size is in half. There are container ships out there that have crew of 17. Was there also additional savings in terms of theft? Theft was definitely an issue uh, in brake bulk shipping. People in the supply chain very quickly could read the marks and numbers off a carton the way I did and kind of know that, well, maybe this carton has transistor radios in it. It could be a problem that wasn't enormous, but it's really aggravating to an importer that, you know, two of his cartons have been opened and some of the cargo taken out. There were different ways that we tried to deal with it. For example, we used to do some of the brake bulk ships they carried whiskey from Scotland and the ship's crew would, when we opened the hatches up, you've got just a full hatch of whiskey. Uh, the ship's crew would open up one or two boxes and ask the longshoremen if they're going to take anything to take them from those boxes so that we didn't wind up with 15 or 20 boxes that were damaged. Did containerization reduce damage to cargo? As we talked about, uh, there's lots of things can happen to a carton of white shirts on its journey from Busan to Chicago. It can get crushed in the ship because too much cargo has been stacked on top of it. And you see crushing problems. Since it's stacked loose in the ship, I mean, we try and stack cargo as tightly as possible. The ship rolls and it pitches and cargo gets damaged that way. Hatch covers can leak, uh, get water, or they have hydraulic lines that operate the hatch covers. Sometimes they leak and you open the hatch and you've got hydraulic fluid on top of the cartons. They can get lost on the dock. As I said, that was my first job was finding the lost cargo. That doesn't mean that in today's environment, there isn't damage to cargo. It does happen. It's just the percentage is extremely small. 
The most common damage is a container gets a hole in the roof. There's a device called a spreader, which interlocks with the corner castings that I talked about. And sometimes, even though there's doubler plates around the corners, the crane operator misses and stabs the roof of the container and water can get in there. It's not a very common event. Uh, when there is a, uh, an accident with containers, it can be pretty spectacular. Uh, as ship sizes have increased, there have been issues with the securing equipment on the large container ships. And there was a rash of accidents two and three years ago where uh, ships pitched a lot of containers over the side of the ship. The one Apis, which lost over 2,000 containers, it had to go back to Japan. Uh, it took almost three months to extricate the rest of the mangled containers and cargo off the deck. Uh, but by and large, the, the amount of damage to cargo in containerization is very small. Can you explain how and why containers became standardized? Uh, Malcolm and his engineers had uh, decided that a 35-foot container was optimum because there's different types of cargo moving different trade lanes around the world. So you're always balancing, you know, the white shirts uh, versus uh, drums of uh, synthetic resin going from Houston to China to make toys. The sea train that I talked about earlier adopted containerization fairly early. They came up to the conclusion that a 27-foot container was ideal for the trade. Other shipping companies, including U.S. lines, adopted the 20-foot container and the 40-foot container as the best for the various trade lanes we serviced. And eventually, the world settled on the 20 and 40-foot container as the standard. So a standard container is, say, 40-foot long, 8-foot wide, and 8.5-foot and tall. So all of the different modes the container passes through, truck, train, barge, ship, terminal, are all geared to handle 20 and 40 foot containers. In recent years, there has been the introduction of a small percentage of 45 foot containers, especially for light cargo, like my white shirts for whoever is replacing Sears Roebuck these days, which you know don't weigh very much, but use a lot of space. But they're very limited in terms of where they can be stowed on a ship. They're particularly difficult on the railroads because the rail cars are made to take four 40-foot containers. The standards for containers, as shown on this chart, are now established by an agency of the United Nations called the International Standards Organization, so that anyone in the world who handles a container can be relatively sure of its specifications, how much weight is safe to handle, uh, my equipment is going to be adequate to pick up and move the container. Can you explain how container ships evolved? So talking about the evolution of shipping, this is a picture of a World War I vintage break bulk ship. And this is the picture of the actual American Challenger at sea. And as you can see, the basic design of the ship didn't change much. You have a hull and you have cranes on deck that lift the cargo into the hold of the ship. The one thing that certainly I feel is that uh, many others agree with me is that these last generation break bulk ships for United States lines, Pacific Far East lines, American President lines, Likes lines, were beautiful ships. They were beautifully architected. They're uh, aesthetically pleasing ships to look at. You know, I'm all for containerization, but sometimes I think the big boxy container ships are kind of ugly. We started out with the, the Ideal X, which was actually a tanker, uh, and she actually still operated as a tanker while she was carrying containers. So she would take fuel oil from Texas to New Jersey, and then she would take loaded containers on deck only. So Malcolm had the ship fitted with racks. But very quickly, the shipping industry started taking World War II vintage vessels and converting them uh, for container use. During World War II, the Maritime Administration of the United States, towards the end of the war, was looking to replace the war tonnage, which was mainly Liberty and Victory-type ships, uh, with more robust ships. And they were called the C-class ships. 
in quite a few of these C2s and C4s were then converted to container ships. By the early 60s, companies uh, started to build purpose-built ships. The first U.S. line's purpose-built ship uh, is the American Lancer. The ship was actually designed to handle palletized brake bulk cargo. Uh, so the Lancer and its sister ship started to be built as palletized ships with large doors on the side of the ship to allow the pallets to be passed to the dock. And then the design was changed to container ships. These ships handled about 1,200 20-foot containers, which at the time, I remember seeing the first Lancer after having worked Challenger-type ships, uh, my breath was taken away at the size of the ship and the size of the cranes that were loading and unloading the ships. But fairly quickly, uh, it was realized that there really wasn't a constraint to the growth of size of container ships as there, as there had been with break bulk. And world trade, as I said, after World War II was growing exponentially. When U.S. lines uh, launched the, its third generation container ship in 1984, I uh, was in Asia for the company. And it was a breakthrough ship. It was 4,400 TUs, which was enormous for that day. And now it seems pretty small. So TUs is a 20-foot equivalent unit. So if you have a 40-foot container, it's equal to 220s. And this is a picture of one of the Econs passing one of the, our first generation container ships in the Panama Canal. As I said, we thought these were going to be the biggest ships ever in the world. But very quickly, we were, we were proved wrong. Asian companies and Maersk lines started to build 12,000 TEU ships. Those were in the 90s. And then in the 2000s, the 15,000 and then 20,000 TEU barrier was broken with these mega ships. Initially, the ships were like three and four containers stacked on deck. Now they're up to 11. Uh, the Lancers were 10 rows wide, so we could stack 10 40-foot containers across the ship. Now there are the ships are wide enough that uh, you can stack 22 containers across the ship. The Ever Ace, it's now the largest container ship in the world. It carries 24,000 20-foot containers. The actual mix is a mix of 20s and 40s. And it can handle 120,000 deadweight tons. Deadweight is how much you can put in a ship. So that's minus fuel um, and stores. It's probably over 100,000 tons of cargo. These ships, as opposed to the brake bulk ships, which had physical constraints because of how much cargo could be stacked on top of each other, there really aren't any constraints to the size of uh, these container ships. They theoretically could go much bigger than even the Ever Ace. Uh, what constrains the size of the container ship is water depth in ports and the size of canals. Uh, we've seen the problem last year with the Evergreen ship, which is just slightly smaller than the Ever Ace, getting stuck in the Suez Canal because the Suez Canal really isn't wide enough for these big ships. It's tricky bringing them through. When we talk about volumes, uh, as I said, we measure in TUs. Uh, it's hard to imagine the size of volumes, but last year uh, there were 100 million TUs of containers shipped globally worldwide. So are containers used all around the world? Definitely. As I talked about the growth of containers, initially it was between the United States and Europe and then uh, the United States to Asia, as Asia became a powerhouse in terms of manufacturing of goods for the United States. You know, it's interesting to note that we think of the United States as being a consumer of merchandise, and it certainly is right now. But up until the early 70s, the United States was actually an export-oriented economy. Shipping was important to the United States in order to get our goods to market in Asia. After the growth in the primary trade lanes, then there was a tremendous effort uh, to containerize uh, other trade lanes. For example, I spent a couple of years on Guam, which has two container cranes, and it became vital to the growth of the Guamanian economy and even to supplying basic necessities to Guam and to the military bases on Guam. 
that containerization work. The smaller trade lanes tend to be north-south. So between the United States and South America, between Europe uh, and Africa, between North Asia and South Asia, and that the kind of cost savings that was seen in the major east-west large trade lanes could be enjoyed by, for example, Brazil, which imports a lot of merchandise from the United States and exports a lot to the United States. How did containerization change the appearance of waterfronts? Changed not only the appearance, but the economic activity in cities. So I said, when I started, I started on Pier 76 North River, which is in the middle of Manhattan. And Manhattan was ringed with what's called finger piers because it was desirable to have the cargo be close to the consumers. And all ports were built that way, where break bulk piers were right in the middle of the city. Containerization changed all that because you need large open areas of land for stacking of containers. This is a picture of just two of the terminals currently in Los Angeles. There are eight in total, and they all can be more than 100. Remember, 100 acres would be a small terminal today. 200, 350 acres is normal, and there's no way you can do that within the city. So containerization really moved cargo handling from the city to areas that had more land. In New York, for example, it was Port Elizabeth and Port Newark in New Jersey. In the San Francisco Bay Area, the containers all moved from San Francisco to Oakland. Currently, there is no cargo that moves through San Francisco. And at one point in time during the break bulk day, San Francisco was the largest port on the West Coast. It's created an interesting dilemma for cities is what do you do with these piers? Because they're definitely built to last. <laughs> So uh, it's interesting, when I got hired, I interviewed on Pier 62 on the North River in New York, which is called the Chelsea Piers. Now, when you say Chelsea Piers to somebody who's been around shipping like I have forever, that means something. They think of the days when there were four piers and there could be eight ships working in the middle of Manhattan. Today, when you say to like my daughter who lives in New York, Oh, I'm going to the Chelsea Piers. She thinks it's a sports complex, which it is. The city of New York repurposed that pier for a sports complex. Is there anything else you want to share with us about your own career in shipping? It was interesting to me because I was hired into the industry right at the tail end of break bulk. So I got to see uh, the transition firsthand. I actually took a summer job in 1969 in New York. Employment agency sent me down to the docks. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Uh, But I really liked it. I enjoyed seeing cargo being moved, having an importer call me up and say, oh, hey, thanks for getting our cargo to us. It was a very gratifying job. I enjoyed being able to actually see the cargo. I still occasionally will have a nightmare about not being able to find some Sears Roebuck cargo. But it was about a little over a year later that the Lancer class ships uh, that I talked about were deployed to Asia uh, and the company US lines needed more people. So it created opportunities for me uh, to be part of the containerization of the Far East service and then other services. I went to Port Elizabeth, as I said, I was just stunned by the, the size of the ships and the cranes. I worked a a little bit there, and then we decided to have the Far East ships run to the U.S. West Coast. So I went to the West Coast. We built our own container terminal. So I got an education really quickly in building container terminals. It was relatively small. It was uh, maybe 50 acres. Uh, It'd be a postage stamp compared to current container terminals. Then I got the privilege of working in Guam, where you know, our, our ability to deliver containers made the difference whether the Guamanian people had ice cream and milk in their stores. If our ship was late, there might not be any ice cream for a couple of days. And I was very unpopular on Guam. I then went to Hong Kong, which is one of the, the largest hubs for containerization in the world. Uh, that particular terminal is probably 10 times the size now that it was uh, when I worked there. 
I then went to the Middle East. I was based in Dubai. Uh, we operated container ports throughout South Asia, India, Pakistan, East Africa, and some of the major ports in the world are in the United Arab Emirates, particularly the port of Dubai. Then I moved on to South America, where I ran the South American division. And unfortunately, they were too ahead of their time. Freight rates collapsed with the introduction of these ships. And unfortunately, U.S. lines went bankrupt in 1987. I then went to work for a terminal operating company based in San Francisco. We probably handled about 25% of all the containers on the U.S. West Coast. And the U.S. West Coast at that time was the entry for containers into the United States. We sold our company in 2007, and then I decided to retire and basically work with nonprofits, a lot of educational uh, initiatives, educational law nonprofits, and including an interest in maintaining the history of shipping. Uh, I'm now on the board of the Steamship Historical Society and really support their mission to try and uh, educate people on the importance of shipping and the role that shipping played in the history of the United States.